This is Stamrust on wheat. We are at a research station in Najoro, Kenya, and this is the rust strain UG99 on wheat plants at that location. Stem rust tends to attack the stem, as the name implies, but it can also infect the leaf. You can see that it raises the epidermis such that the, the plant will lose a lot of moisture and over time this disease can increase to cover the entire stems and in doing that um, there are quite significant losses of yield. The objective of the agronomist and plant breeder is to produce varieties that are free of rust and we will illustrate some of the symptoms of how those varieties behave in the following slides. This shows an array of responses of varieties with different levels of resistance with a susceptible control on your right. We rate the levels of resistance or intermediate reactions relative to an image or a, a figure in your mind that is something like the image on the right, such as the image on your left is resistant and you can see virtually no signs of disease. The plants are in fact infected, but the plant is so hypersensitive to the pathogen that you cannot see where it attempted to enter the leaf or the leaf sheath surface. In this image, you can see these very small responses to infection by the spotting. This is where the spores have germinated, attempted to penetrate, and the plant has responded by preventing the pathogen developing further. In the next picture, you can see some development to spirulation. These are the spores that are produced, that are spread to the adjacent plants or are spread by wind to other fields and indeed to other countries. And you can see in this image you have some penetrations where you can't see spirulation um, and overall we would call it a moderately resistant reaction. Moving forward to the next one, you see there's more disease development relative to the one we've just described. We might call this a medium level, a moderately resistant to moderately susceptible, if you like, response. You see the pustules are getting larger. We are, by these letters, describing the pustules. We are not so much here describing the amount of disease, but rather just the symptoms of the pustules or the uridinia. Moving to the next one is moderately susceptible. You see they're getting bigger, um, about the same numbers, but gradually getting bigger. Moderately susceptible to susceptible with larger, some smaller, and then we go to the extreme level, which we call susceptible. In the field, we attempt to describe the responses of our varieties or our breeding materials in terms of these ratings. And then we, we make records, which we can use in the future, or we can send to colleagues in other countries and so on to convey the information that we get with their lines compared to what they might get in tests in their own countries. So overall the assumption is that a variety that is highly resistant will not suffer from a high yield loss and a variety that with a lot of disease um, because the plant has to produce lots and lots of spores it loses its ability to make seed or reduces its ability to make seed such that high crop losses are experienced. In the previous set of images we showed the different reactions or responses to stem rust. In this set of images we're showing that the 
amounts of disease within response classes can be different. For example, if we take the top image, you can see there are many pustules and we would probably describe it by a figure of something like 80% of the leaf area covered with spirulating pustules or uridinia. In the bottom image, you can see there's only four uridinia and obviously in terms of crop loss, the one at the top, the variety responding as the one at the top would be much, would have much more serious loss than a variety that's responding at the bottom. In other words, a variety that has a few large pustules or uridinia uh, is not likely to suffer from significant crop loss. The only problem is that this is a static comparison. These varieties are not yet um, mature. There is a possibility that the um, image at the bottom, it could be that if you came back in 10 days' time, it might look like the image at the top, and that is that the epidemic is still developing. Therefore, it's a good idea to record the disease over time to make sure that the response at the bottom is a true indication of the genetic makeup of that particular variety compared to the genetic makeup of the variety at the top. And this assumes an approximately equal maturity. Obviously, if the maturity of the one at the top is ahead of the one at the bottom, then you could have a disease progress. Now, within this group, all of the uridinia can be described as S or susceptible. To convey the information that we have in this image, we use a percentage cover of the stem. So at the bottom we might call it maybe 2S, meaning 2% 2 of the, the, the uh, uh, leaf sheath surface is covered with sporulating areas. The second one from the bottom we could describe maybe as 10 or 15S. The next one, 20 to 30S. The next maybe 50 to 60S, and as I said earlier, the top would be scored as an 80S. And we assume that the amount of disease is correlated with crop loss, and of course there, there is adequate experimental evidence to say that that relationship is generally true. Just as an example, to show that we can use this percentage relationship in another class. This is the MR, or moderately resistant class, and you can see again that the um, proportion of leaf, of leaf sheath area covered with spirulating or diseased area increases from the bottom to the top. So at the bottom we might regard this as a, a 5 MR or a little less, then we would have a maybe a 10 or 15 MR up to maybe a 20 or a 25 MR. Um, and so you could go, go to higher ratings. But often with these um, resistant and MR categories, you don't progress to having 100% um, leaf sheath cover with those categories. That is to say, to some extent, the the disease response is not totally correlated with the um, percentage um, of leaf cover. The effect of disease on the plant is loss of yield and loss of grain quality. On your left, you have a good example of plump grain that has been protected from rust for example, by resistance or by chemical control. As we move uh, from left to right, we have increasing levels of disease or conversely um, less
protection of yield. And you can see that compared to the first sample of seed, these other grains are showing more variation in size. They're showing a blemished colour, increased blemished colour and smaller size. Move to the third one, it's smaller compared to the second. The fourth is smaller still. And in the last sample, we simply have chaff. The, the farmers describe this situation as simply harvesting dust because the grain blows away. To show this in a more close-up way, we have samples of 20 kernels from each group. And again, you can see the decreasing size of the grain and also the poorer appearance of quality as we move from one to the other. In this last example, we did obtain grain from amongst the chaff that you saw earlier, but that grain would be completely lost by, um, by its blowing away in the threshing and cleaning process. Similarly, in the second from the last, there would be a very high levels of loss also. And reinforcing the last two examples, once that grain, if captured, was milled, most of the content would be lost with the bran and the fractions of the grain that are not used to make flour. Whereas in the first two samples, the, there would be a much higher flour yield. That is to say that with disease loss, the loss in the flour is even much greater than the loss of grain yield itself.